It's good to see each and every one of you here tonight. Appreciate your presence. There are three verses in John chapter 14 that I would like for us to examine this evening. Uh, They are some of the most interesting verses that we find in all of God's Word, and they are also some of the most difficult to try to understand. I say this because Jesus spoke of us, His disciples, that includes us, doing greater works than He did while He was here upon this earth. And He also told them, not once, but twice, that whatever they ask in His name, He will do it. Have you ever stopped to ask yourself, what does Jesus mean by these statements, that you and I are going to do greater works than He did, and that whatever we ask in His name, He will do it for us? What do those things mean in our lives? Tonight, I want us to drink deeply from God's Word, at least these verses, and I hope that what we see are those things which help us to be greater servants in God's kingdom. So, notice the verses. Notice what John says, or what Jesus says, excuse me, that John writes for us. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater than these he will do, because I go to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Let's go back and break this down. Doing greater works than our Lord did. It is a promise, he tells us, to those who believe in Christ. If you look up there, he says, I say to you, he who believes in me. That is that that person who believes in Christ, that would, that would account for those of us here tonight. All of us are believers in Jesus Christ. We believe in Christ. And Jesus, throughout this section, if you go back to John chapter 14, in the very beginning of verse, the chapter, verse 1, he has been appealing to their faith and appealing for them to have even greater faith. Remember what he said? Verse 1, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. And then after telling Philip that those who had seen him had seen the Father, down in verse 9, he asked Philip, Do you believe that I am in the Father and the Father's in me? And then verse 11, he says, Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. You have this, believe, believe, believe. And then here in verse 12, he says to the 11, Truly I I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. So throughout this entire section, the focus has been to a good extent upon the fruitfulness of anyone who has faith in Jesus. There's a fruitfulness that we are told we will enjoy. And so his promise The promise that he makes to us, really, if you think about it, kind of staggers the mind. Because Jesus said that the person who has that kind of faith, he says, will do what I have been doing. He who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And not only that, he says, he will do greater works. Greater works than what Jesus did. So here's my question. Maybe, maybe you were already ahead of me. What are the greater works? He says, you're going to do greater works than I have done. What are those greater works? Does it mean that you and I as Christians are going to do more than Jesus did because we have more time upon this earth in which to do it? Does it mean that we are going to do more spectacular works? more supernatural works than Jesus did? I think it's kind of hard, if you think about it, for us to do anything more spectacular than what Jesus has already done, raising Lazarus from the dead after he's been dead for four days. Or taking a few loaves and fish and multiplying them so as to feed thousands. Or turning water into wine. I know how to put food coloring into water, but it doesn't make it wine. And, and Jesus, he's been telling them he's about to return to his Father, and he also, as we learn, is about to be glorified. 
As a matter of fact, there's a prayer that he will pray at the end of this section, last little thing he does in the upper room with his disciples before leaving. It's found in John chapter 17. And there's a couple of statements that he makes I want to draw to your attention. One is in John chapter 17 there in verse 2. He says, or verse 1, excuse me, he says, Father, the hour has come, glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. And then just a few verses later in verses 4 and 5, he adds, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. In other words, restore to me that glory that I shared with you before we ever created the world. As a result of his glorification, Jesus' followers will not only know more about who he is, but also what he does. His promise is that everything that we would do and say under the new covenant, because that's what we're under now, the new covenant, the covenant that is established by his blood. We're living in that covenant. If you go back and you look at the book of Acts, what you find is after Jesus ascends back to his Father, after he sits down at the right hand of the majesty on high, he empowers the apostles with the Holy Spirit to do great miracles. Those miracles are recorded in the book of Acts. You go to Acts chapter 3 and what do you find? Jesus, I mean, excuse me, Peter and John are going up to the temple at the hour of prayer about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. They encounter a lame man there by the gate called Beautiful at the temple. And what do they do? He causes him, he heals him so he's able to walk. Go to chapter 5 and what you find there is people are taking their sick and they're laying them. If Peter is walking down the way, they're laying them out so that hopefully Peter's shadow might fall on those people so that they will be healed. You go to Acts chapter 9, and what do you find there? There's a woman by the name of Dorcas. I prefer the the name Tabitha, but Peter heals her. You go to Acts chapter 19, and I love this one. Paul is on his third missionary journey. He's been in Ephesus for a while, and he's teaching and he's preaching, but he's also having to support himself as a tent maker. And so people are taking his aprons and his handkerchiefs and they're taking them to the sick so that as Luke tells us there in Acts 19 verses 11 and 12, the diseases would leave them and the evil spirits would go out. But these miracles were not greater miracles than Jesus had done while he was among them. So... What is he talking about? It's more likely that what Jesus is talking about there are the works that would be accomplished through the church, through us, because of his death, his resurrection, and his exaltation back to the Father. Here's where I'm going with that. Go back to the book of Acts, and what do you see? Acts 2. 3,000 souls added to the church as a result of Peter's preaching and the work of God's Spirit on that day. You keep going through Acts and you keep finding 5,000. The number comes to be about 5,000. The church is multiplying. Many numbers are added to their number. Many are added to their number. On and on it goes so that Jesus' point that he makes there in Acts chapter 1 when they ask him, is it this this time that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he talks about what they're going to do, be witnesses. Where? In Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the remotest parts of the earth. Well, that's exactly what happens. So that by the time Paul writes his letter to the church at Colossae, there in Colossians chapter 3 verse 23, you know what he says? He says that the gospel has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven. We've taken it everywhere. And when you come to the book of Revelation, as John is able to bear witness to the things he's allowed to see, and one of the things he sees, as he tells us in chapter 7 of that book, is this great multitude. 
And he begins to describe this multitude. He says that it is a multitude that no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes. They're the redeemed. Think about for just a moment all those who have obeyed the gospel from the first day till today. All of the numbers of people who have come to Christ since the apostles first spoke on that day there in Jerusalem. Greater works than these will you do. Why is this possible? What he says, you will do greater works than these. Why? Because I go to the Father. Because I go to the Father. When Jesus spoke of the one who believes in him being able to do greater works than those he had done, he wasn't pointing to a contrast between himself and what he had done and the disciples and the church and what it would do. No. He was speaking of the difference between the works that he did while he was here on this earth through his own personal ministry and then what would be done through his disciples and the church after his death and his exaltation. Now that he's been restored or returned to his glory, now that he's received the glory that he had with the Father before the beginning of time, he's no longer limited by his human nature. He now has the ability to empower and to equip his disciples, Christians, through, his, through the Holy Spirit to carry out great things in sharing the message of God's Word. And it's because of the power of the Holy Spirit working within us that God is able, I love the way Paul puts it over in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. He's able to do exceeding abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. That's where my title came from. Beyond all that we ask or think. God is able to work and accomplish beyond our imagination. And it's because Jesus has returned to His Father that the Spirit is made available to the church and that the church is able to do what God calls us to do. But let's look at what he says there in verses 13 and 14. Verse 13, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. Verse 14, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Not only has Jesus ascended back to his Father and made the Holy Spirit available to us, but also we're able to do these greater works and it's because... As Jesus said, we ask in His name. As a matter of fact, twice He tells us, whatever we ask in His name, He will do it. Now, I need to caution you because there are some people that take this verse, and you've heard of this. They proclaim a health, wealth gospel. Maybe you've heard it. Name it and claim it in prayer. All you've got to do is name it in the name of Jesus, claim it, and God is going to make it available to you. I want a million dollars. Claim it in the name of Jesus. I want a new car. I claim it in the name of Jesus. I want to get well from this cancer that I've got. I claim it in the name of Jesus. If you don't get well, what are you told? You don't have faith. You don't have enough faith. That's the problem. It's your faith. No, it's not the faith. Because we find in Scripture that there are others that didn't get better, weren't spared. Stephen wasn't spared being stoned to death. Lord, just put away these people so that I don't have to die right now because I'm doing a good work for you. If you look at 1 Timothy chapter Four, or excuse me, chapter 5, verse 23, we find there Paul telling Timothy to do something. He says, use a little wine for your stomach's sake or for your, and your frequent ailments. Why well, didn't he just say, Timothy, just claim it. Ask in the name of Jesus that you'll be made well. He didn't do that. And if you look at 2 Timothy, there in chapter 4, verse 20, Paul said that he left Trophimus 
sick at Miletus. Why? Why didn't he just heal him? Why didn't he just claim it? Ask in Jesus' name, you'll be made well. You see, folks, to ask something in Jesus' name is not to use his name as some kind of magical incantation. Nor is it just to add it on to a prayer. No, prayer in Jesus' name is the offering of a prayer in accordance with all that his name stands for as the divine Son of God. It is to connect that prayer with his person, his character, his will, his power. It's not a prayer for personal revenge. Please take care of this person for me. It's not a prayer for personal ambition. Please do this for me. Do this for me. No. There is a purpose behind our asking. What is the purpose? If you go back and look at what Jesus said, their latter part of verse 13, it is so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. The purpose of our asking in the name of Christ is that so that His Father will be glorified in Him. That's what He did while He was here on this earth. I glorified your name. And that's what He still is working to do as He sits on His throne in heaven. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, just to give you an example if I may, Paul speaks there about a thorn that he's been given in the flesh. And he says that three times he pleaded with the Lord to take it away. Well, he's asking something in Jesus' name, I'm sure, but it's not taken away. It remains. Why? Have you ever stopped to ask why? I mean, if you take what we're reading here in John 14... Jesus said, anything you ask in my name, I will do it. But Paul's told, no, I'm not going to take it away. Why? I think there are two reasons. And you may come up with more, but I've got two I want to share with you tonight. The first is this. Paul said that the thorn in the flesh was given to him to keep him from exalting himself. What do we do when we exalt ourselves? we neglect to exalt God because to exalt self is not to glorify God. Peter said that God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. And James said almost the same thing over in James chapter 4, verse 10, but then he adds this, Humble yourselves, therefore, in the presence of the Lord and He will exalt you. So I think, first of all, For Paul to have that taken away may have taken away from the exaltation, the glorification of God. But secondly, I think there's another reason, and that is this. The Lord allowed his thorn to remain because he said, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. What I think Christ was saying to Paul is, I'm going to leave the thorn, Paul, because through your weakness, I'm glorified. Because people realize it's not you doing it, it's me doing it. And if I'm glorified, the Father gets the glory. And it's really about my Father getting the glory. Remember something Paul said? He said, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. When we pray in Jesus' name, what we are doing is we're asking God for those things which will glorify Him. Let this bring glory to you. So when you pray for the salvation of a loved one, you're really asking God for something that will ultimately bring glory to His name. Another soul is saved. When you're praying for the salvation of an enemy, You're asking for something that will bring glory to God. Have you ever stopped to think how many people were praying for Saul to obey the gospel? He was persecuting the church. If anything, there may have been some Christians, Lord, I wish you'd just strike him dead and get rid of this obstacle to the proclamation of your word. 
But I believe there were some Christians that were saying, Lord, bring him to you. Turn him around. Convert him. Put, and remember, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks, as the old King James puts it. He kept putting things in front of him that he had to deal with. You see, that brought glory ultimately to God because what did Paul do? Paul would go on, remember what he did? He would become the apostle to the Gentiles. Thirteen of the letters that we have that we, we know of in the New Testament are written by him. And think of all the Christians, as I shared this past Sunday, that are Christians because of what he did all those years ago. Christ desires to glorify his Father. What about when we pray that the gospel reach into the places in the world where people haven't yet heard it or need to hear it again? What about when we pray that God will heal a troubled marriage? Will that bring glory to Him? Yes, I believe that it does. And when we pray for the spreading of His light throughout this community because of the work that we've been doing for these last few months, it brings glory to Him. And that's what we're trying to do is ultimately bring glory to God. So as we conclude tonight, I want to leave you with this thought. Actually, I want to leave you with a thought, first of all, and then a challenge. Here's the thought. Because Jesus has gone back to His Father, there exists the potential within this congregation to do even greater things in the future than this congregation has done in the past. Think about that for just a moment. There is the potential for this congregation to do far greater things in the future than has been done in the past. Exceedingly, exceeding abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, as Paul would say. Why? Because as Jesus said there in John 14, we believe in Him. And He has glorified His Father by giving His life life to save us from our sins he has now ascended back to his father and is seated at his father's right hand and so when we ask in his name for those things which will bring glory to his father he will do it and the salvation of souls and the proclamation of the gospel and the changing of lives in this community will bring glory to our lord and that's what we want is it not so in your prayers why not pray that God will use this church to bring even more glory to His name and that everything that we're doing now will bring glory to His name because that's what we want. But then here's the challenge. I want to encourage each of us, myself included, to make it our goal to work at teaching and influencing those who follow us so that the future of this church will be bright and they will accomplish even greater works than we have done to this point in time. So that God gets even more glory. And that's pray that God will bring even greater glory to Himself through what He allows us to do in this community. Can you imagine what that would look like? I had a lady in my office on Monday that was talking to me about her son that goes to school in Dixon. And a comment he made, I just caught it offhandedly. He said, they're talking about this church and school in Dixon. I said, what? Yeah, the Waverly Church of Christ. Folks, I am not trying to promote us or put us up on a pedestal. That is not my goal tonight. But if we're being talked about, I hope that it's about it's bringing God glory. That's the only reason, is that God gets all of the glory. And when we go and make deliveries, those of us who are making the deliveries, one of the things we try to do at every home where we, we leave something, can we have a prayer with you before we go? Would you allow us to have a prayer? And we have yet to be turned down. I don't think anybody's going to say, well, no, I really don't want you to pray with me. 
I know you brought me a washer and dryer, but please don't pray with me. We have not been turned down yet. And Lord willing, we won't be. But one of the things when I have the privilege to pray that I always try to pray is, Lord, whatever we're able to do here, may you receive the glory. The glory is his. Jesus came to bring glory to his Father. He did it through his death upon the cross. And now he is working to bring even more glory to his Father through the proclamation of his truth and through, the, through those who are added on a regular basis to his kingdom. Let's work to see that continue. Tonight, maybe you're a child of the kingdom that has not been living that way. And it's time for you to say, I need to change my life. I've called myself a Christian for years, but I really haven't been living as one. I want to change that. And if you will allow us, we'd love to pray with you and for you and ask God to forgive you and to strengthen you for further service in his kingdom. But maybe tonight you're a person here that you're not even a part of that kingdom. You've yet to confess Christ as Lord and Savior, to acknowledge that he is the one who is the only way to God. And tonight you'd like to do that. You'd like to turn from your sin and turn to him in obedient faith and be buried with him in baptism so he can wash away your sins. If you need to do that, we want to encourage you to come right now as together we stand and sing.